Okay, Carrie, welcome back to the podcast. I think you are now on a very short list of people who have uh, returned to the Health Path podcast. <laughs> All right, hooray. I'm so glad to be here, Alex. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. I'm eagerly waiting for the, your next bit of content to see what it's going to be. So uh, we were just saying off air that your kind of social media has kind of exploded over the last few months. And I kind of said that I feel it's partly because of your ability to articulate some quite complex stuff and break it down and, and give people actionable takeaways, which is obviously what everyone is really keen for, I think, especially with this kind of stuff. So in the first episodes, we really introduced circadian biology. We introduced the concept of the importance of light, water and magnetism for human health. And I definitely encourage everyone to go back and listen to that episode because I'm hoping that really just lays the foundations for what we can start to explore today. Um, I recently listened to your webinar on the Quantum Biology Summit, which was fascinating around kind of the electric body. And I'd love to kind of pick your brain a little bit around that today, if that's okay. But you being the expert, I'm going to kind of put the ball in your court, you know, thinking back to that first conversation we had, what's, the, I guess, the most natural progression of that conversation? Do you know, I think it's exactly what you alluded to in terms of talking about the body from a different perspective. Uh, we did talk about, right, circadian rhythm and water and all these important things, but I think it really is important for people to wrap their brain around the fact that we were taught that the body is a biochemical body, that it only really responds to chemistry, um, which sets the stage for pharmaceutical interventions and supplement interventions and e even food, right? Even nutritional interventions. But what I'm trying to kind of wrap people's brain around is the fact that our body is actually full of the flow of electricity in a couple of different ways, um, in a lot, in several ways actually, and that that is the true operating system of the body. So when we can take it a step further, and it's not to say that nutrition doesn't matter, it's not to say that there aren't some important supplements and things like that, but if we can take it a step further and say, okay, these are the things that influences your electric body, it's foundational, right? That's really foundational to health. Mm, absolutely, and. What's the sort of segue into this concept of the body being uh, electric or electrical? You kind of com you mentioned that there are two ways to think about this. Well, the first one that I, well, I, I there's more than two, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start, start simple, right? The first was just the fact that some really, really amazing biophysicists made some interesting observations, right? To say that things are happening too quickly. Like, you know, a, uh, a cat reacting to a snake and just jumps up into the air five feet, you know, four feet, however high it is. Um, and so it's like, what is really driving the body's ability to react that quickly? And then also to coordinate everything. I mean, we're so complex. We're full of trillions of cells and these cells actually have hundreds of thousands of tasks happening every single second. And so there has to be a better way to explain what's happening at the, the level of functionality of a human, right? How can we react so quickly? How can we uh, coordinate everything? And so that's where I really like to highlight the fact that if you break it down, our body is actually full of just flows of electrons. Um, and so like I have, I'm full of tissues and organs and they're made up of cells and these cells are made up of molecules and these molecules are made up of atoms and these atoms are made up of electrons, protons, neutrons, and then photons that can interact and or be released from these subatomic particles. And so if you recognize that that is foundational, like that's what we are, we're just a bunch of vibrant subatomic particles that happen, I happen to be organized to look like Carrie, you're organized to look like Alex. Um, but if we can then see that, okay, how is it put together this way? Well, then you recognize that all of these particles are surrounded by water. And it really is then the flow of these, this information through the water network of our body, that special structured water in our body is how my, uh, my pointer finger can communicate and know what's happening in my baby toe can know what's happening in my right ventricle. You know, I mean, all of these things can get coordinated because that water network is co connected and it's the flow of electrical information that can happen faster than the speed of light that really organizes everything. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and obviously water was a key part of our first conversation. Right. You, you kind of introduced the concept of exclusion zone water 
and how it's partly got that name because it's excluding everything from um, electrons and is it photons? Those sort of two. Any, the only things that flow through exclusion zone water are electrons and photons, right? So electrons and light, basically. Mm. And the, the basic concept that we talked about a lot was how that water can be a battery. And so we do know that that water network sets us up to have a, so a negative charge because that water that surrounds everything, Alex, has a negative charge, which is unusual for water. It's typically neutral. And it forms that negative charge because it, it structures itself in a way that kicks out a positive charge. It kicks out a hydrogen. And so you have right next to the, the exclusion zone that's negative, you have a proton zone, a hydrogen zone that's positive. And that's a battery, right? That's exactly why a battery has a positive end and a negative end, because then electrons will flow from an area where they're more concentrated to an area where they're less concentrated. That's electricity. And to know that we have that electricity flow literally around everything in our body and that it can work in that small level, right? By creating a battery of potential energy everywhere, but then it can also be this big super highway of interconnected flow that really starts to allow people to recognize how cool the body is at the quantum level. Okay. So does that bring in, you commented in the webinar as listening to the living matrix and I forget mm -hmm. the doctor, but one of the, the sort of researchers that you follow. So this kind of falls into this kind of area, I think I'm right in saying. 100%, yeah. And so like the organ system that Western medicine has ignored the most is the fascia, the connective tissue. Um, and the researcher that's brought this to a lot of prominence uh, from a biophysical perspective is James Oshman, Dr. Jim Oshman. Really, really cool. If anyone wants to like, he's got some great videos, you know, he does a, he's a really good speaker on this topic uh, on YouTube. Um, and so what he really highlighted that was just like this light bulb moment for me was the fact that what we were told to cut away in anatomy class, like, you know, cut away the fascia around the heart to see the actual organ and cut away the fascia, you know, around uh, the lungs to kind of separate everything up. It's like that, that fascia is actually where the flow of this information that I'm talking about, this electrical information happens. And so uh, it's, and it's really hard to appreciate in a cadaver lab in a, in a dissection because it doesn't have the water with it, right? So it does just look like this structural component of the body. And so we do know it supports our frame. It, it supports the transfer of forces, but it actually is this interconnected highway because it's it, the connective tissue with, that we can feel maybe like my iliotibial band on the side of my thigh or my uh, columbar thoro, columbar fascia at the back of in, in my low back. Like we have these areas where we know that there's connective tissue and fascia, but from that macroscopic perspective, that broad perspective, that fascia gets smaller and smaller and smaller and branches tinier and tinier and tinier. And literally it surrounds every cell as the extracellular matrix. It goes into every cell as the cytoskeleton. It then goes into the nucleus of every cell as the nuclear matrix. So what this now forms is a continuum, right? We have this contiguous network where every cell is interconnected. And that, contigu that, that connective tissue that connects everything that, that Dr. Oshman calls the living matrix is surrounded by this special water. So you can now see that this is might, might be a key way that cells not only derive energy from that, that negative positive charge, but also it's a conduit then, a continuous conduit through which electrons and photons, the, the true and protons, the true communication molecules of the body can take place. Okay. And this explains the complex interaction, as you were saying earlier, of everything that's going on, the 100,000 tasks in every cell and how cells and organs are synchronized I guess, the, mm -hmm. uh, throughout the body, but also throughout the day, bringing in the circadian element to this as well. Correct. Correct. So like we, in the previous episode, we talked about light entering the eye, setting a circadian rhythm, right? It, we have a clock in our brain that receives the light signals that enter our eye and it, it interprets those light signals and then sends a message to every cell of the body. If that had to have been done in a biochemical perspective, if, there if, if that was driven by the release of a hormone that then triggered this cascade that then had to bind to the surface of the cell to communicate a message, and if that had to happen all the time, it wouldn't work. And so that clock in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus actually oscillates, it vibrates. And very similar to uh, electrons and protons and photons, a vibration can also get passed entirely through this water network. 
Wow. And then, and then communicate instantaneously what's happening. And so that can change the, it, it informs the clock genes in the cell and it changes gene expression based on the time of day. Mm. And one thing I've been really interested in and trying to find, I guess, more research on is this, the seasonality of mm -hmm. this as well, how I was looking at one study and it was exploring adolescents going through sort of their growth spurts, I guess, ultimately in puberty and seeing how there were changes in genetic expression based on the seasons that seem to explain why in the summer kids break up from school all have these growth spurts and come back in September and everyone's like oh my god um and they were talking about the role that essentially the season and I imagine therefore light is having a huge impact on this because it's impacting it's impacting everything well absolutely it makes sense that we are going to try to time our growth with when the body, with when food would be plentiful, because mm. we we need the substrate to build, right? We can't build out of nothing. So the light entering your eyes then tells the brain, oh, it's the middle of the summer, right? Because there's way more brightness, way more blue light frequency, UV light. And so that tells us that it's the middle of summer. We have long days. We can find food. We can, uh, you know, consume uh, vegetables, animals, whatever, whatever we can get. Like our environment is, is rich and plentiful. So that's then why they're going to signal the hormone pathways to say, yes, now you can grow. It's a more anabolic season, right? It's a building season. And then the winter, you have more of a catabolic season season because if we're if you're living in a northern latitude like me um it's if i were to try to find food outside it'd be very challenging right so most likely it, my body wants to go through a breakdown phase in a good way right it wants to break down damaged proteins it wants to, and recycle them for use like it's a recycling system it wants to break down body fat that may my, my when my eyes and I don't, I don't want this to like trigger people to not go outside at this time of year but when my eyes really start to perceive the light is waning right so end of summer early fall I'm actually supposed to become mildly insulin resistant put on a little extra body fat uh, or or you know and it, not necessarily change what I'm eating right but I'm meant to put on just a little extra fat because my brain is perceiving that oh Carrie is going to be entering a period of scarcity if I if it waited until the first snowfall for me for me to do that I wouldn't I would have failed as a species right we would have failed as a species so it really preps me for this season to say okay well then now that now that there's scarcity and way more melatonin which it happens in a darker time right it's released in darkness then that ties that to, okay, my body can now break things down and repair. Melatonin is a major repair hormone. And so that's where we have metabolic winter, where we're just kind of becoming more efficient, using up stored resources to then come back out in the spring and kind of do it all over again. Amazing. And that actually brings in um, a, quite a particular question that I got asked recently in our sort of community. And I thought, it would be lovely to hear your words in regards to your response. And I think I have at least some of the answer, but you obviously may well know a lot more around this, which is the question was basically around how can the body tell, so to speak, what time of day it is, and therefore how important is that kind of infrared at sunrise? Um, so this idea being if someone, for whatever reason, can't get outside early on in the day, um, how much of an impact can that have from sort of a circadian perspective? Um, it's a great question. And it, a lot of it depends on how tied they are to their, their locations, natural day night fluctuations. So if, if this is someone who lives indoors, works indoors, hates going outside, wears sunglasses all the time, stares at an artificially blue lit television at night or, you know, a cell phone screen, um, has, you know, lights on in their bedroom where it's a bright in their sleeping environment. I would say missing that circadian reset you get every single morning at sunrise can be really challenging. However, if someone has taken the time to kind of work on their circadian environment and their circadian lifestyle, um, it's important to note that it's the infrared, red and blue uh, intensity that appears right at sunrise that wakes up the hormone centers of the brain and really gets our body revved up and rolling for the day. If, if that happens, if we miss it every once in a while, once we have a strong circadian rhythm, it's way less, impa less impactful. You can actually then sync up within two hours after sunrise, right? You can go outside and then anytime you're outside, you're again, syncing a clock, reinforcing your internal clock to the sun. So 
I guess it depends. It's not an exact answer. Uh, if your circadian rhythm is strong, you have a lot of leeway, a lot more leeway than if you're someone who doesn't have a strong circadian rhythm. Um, and I've got clients who they either uh, work at sunrise or, you know, they've been such night owls. They cannot, cannot see the sunrise. And, it, and it's like, don't let perfect be the enemy of enemy of good be really consistent with sunset. It's going to get you a timing mechanism and then block the artificial light at night so that you can really start to at least sync up with something. And then when you are outside, sunglasses off, car windows down, maybe before you enter your car, stare up at the sky for 10 seconds, you'll sky gaze a little bit more and you'll start to kind of reinforce the whole cycle. Mm, brilliant. That's a very uh, sensible answer as well as a good one. Um, <laughs> I think I read the other day around how sort of morning infrared light or sunrise will also bring forward um, sort of melatonin production that night. Is that right? Well, there's two places that we make melatonin. We make melatonin from our pineal gland at night. Um, and that's in response to actually how much morning ultraviolet light we get. Um, and, and then and then assuming we have a dark environment at night, that's when the pineal gland makes a ton of melatonin. But we also make another um, melatonin in ourselves. It's called subcellular melatonin. And we make it all day in response to infrared light uh, because like our cells are doing these tasks and creating metabolic damage. Um, you know, these our mitochondria essentially are in need of repair all day long uh, to just have their optimized function, metabolic function. And so when we get that infrared exposure onto our skin, uh, either from being in sunlight or a red light therapy panel or something along those uh, lines, we're creating that subcellular melatonin. So it's like, we're repairing all day long so that when we do go to sleep at night, like that melatonin can tackle the big tasks, you know? <laughs> nice. Okay. That makes total sense. Thank you very much. Um, and then going just back to, I guess, this fascia, um, mm -hmm. I think you've posted and you might have talked about sort of the role of, of movement within this. And you know, some of what you mentioned earlier really reminds me of some conversations I've had with body workers who will also talk about how um, memories can be potentially stored in our fascia. And I'm wondering if you've got thoughts both on just from a, a movement perspective, but also if there's anything I'll say in the quantum biology sort of realm that might connect with this idea of memories and yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I was a body worker at one point, right? I, I'm a trained, you know, um, massage therapist. And, and I've seen this several times where, where a memory gets released. It's like you're holding a knot or some stuck fascia, congested fascia, and then all of a sudden a memory gets released. Um, and it could be, a, it could be a, a memory of a trauma. It could be a happy memory. It could actually be the release of a substance. Like I felt uh, anesthesia leave the body and things like that before from surgery surgeries. Um, and so, yeah, I think that the, co the combination of the fascia, but it really is the water that surrounds the fascia that can store memory. And then the fascia rearranges itself in a way to almost like wall itself off from a trauma. And so you can almost dehydrate the fascia to kick the memory out for a little while. And then when you're holding pressure, right? So someone who holds, we can all do this, right? You can hold a knot with your thumb with constant pressure and you start to feel your, the thumb sink into the knot and soften and soften and soften. And so what happens when you apply continuous pressure to fascia, you, uh, you stimulate the fascia to release a substance called hyaluronic acid that really is water hungry, it's water loving. So it pulls tons of fresh new water into that fascia. And that new water can structure itself as a way of either releasing a memory re or reminding the body of a memory or something along those lines, because water can create special micro clustering, um, to actually store information. Uh, water based computer technology is actually way better than the silicon based stuff that we're using these days. You know, the, the, the binary code water can actually be reconfigure itself in many, many ways, um, beyond binary. It's got five different orientations. So you can essentially you think about a computer that has can store as much of the information as you can store on your computer and then multiply that times five. That's how our water can kind of rearrange itself to store memory. Um, and so that's what kind of happens with the water. I, I feel like the water is a, a connection between where our body maybe has had a trauma of some sort. And then the fascia can, can, can wall off the trauma. It can dehydrate itself 
And that when you bring fresh water into the area, you're reactivating that memory. And you give the body, I think, a chance to process it mentally and physically. Amazing. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay. Um, and brings a whole new dimension to sort of massage therapists saying, drink your water. After. Right, <laughs> right, right. Um, okay. And then from that perspective, a, a question that comes to mind is on this concept of quantum biology, I guess, and how cells are communicating via this kind of cellular highway and that may explain the complexities of sort of human physiology is there anything that you've read or even just thought around from a sort of person to person perspective we know for example if a group of people come together and prayer and do prayer or meditate that there can be shifts in that sort of environment i'm wondering if if there's anything around how um sort of person to person these things relate Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's so many interesting things like this. I mean, this is just person to cat, but they were finding that cats purr at 50 Hertz and that that's very soothing actually to the body, to the brain, but also to the mitochondria. It's weird, right? It's just, it's just kind of bizarre as you start to dive into the research, but that being said, right. Um, I've talked a lot about infrared the importance of that infrared for the subcellular melatonin. I didn't mention it this time, but last episode, we talked about how the infrared builds that special water battery. You know, it expands it. So if you're talking first about person to person, I think cuddling actually is a share of infrared. So that's oftentimes why I think that's um, someone, someone almost has more infrared stored and it can be draining. So for someone who's a, who's a hands-on worker or, you know, maybe you're with a sick child or something. I think we can share infrared and we do as a way to help heal the body from that water perspective. Um, and I think, you know, two healthy people can sit next to each other and also almost like conserve your infrared, right? You can, can keep that exclusion zone water, that water battery charge. So there might be a reason why at the quantum level, connecting and holding hands, like hugs, holding hands, cuddling, all of those things are considered health promoting activities. Um, and then when you actually step away from the body, you have to recognize that we do have a, we have a field of information flowing around us, which, you know, has been known in, in ancient times for a long time. And modern science is really starting to appreciate and hone in on it more. And we call it the bio field. And there's, there's different layers, right? So my heart, we know can actually create a magnetic field that can be measured with very sensitive equipment about 22 feet away from my body. So really far away from my body. Um, but even uh, just person to person, we can sense someone else's heart field six feet away from that. I'm sorry, I don't know the meters. I'm silly American. I don't know the meters translation on that one, um, but six feet away from the body, which means that when you're in the presence of other people who are creating really have, have a lot of joy, have a lot of love, um, laughter, gratitude, all of these really, really higher elevation, higher frequency emotions, you can feel them. And that can shift your magnetic field. So a stronger magnetic field will influence a weaker magnetic field, which, you know, oftentimes people say, oh, that, per uh, that person's just so magnetic, right? I want to be around them. And it really is because it's influencing your magnetic field uh, from a quantum perspective. Amazing. And mm -hmm. that, I mean, that really brings in, I'm training in transformational breath at the moment, and we use sounds as a way to do that, as a way to essentially attract mm -hmm. negative emotions to a, a higher um, frequency, ultimately. And it's wow. amazing to see kind of what happens. Um, where was I going with this? There was something that I wanted to expand on there. Oh, yes, I guess just um, sound, ultimately. And again, how that must influence the water and the structure here. Oh yeah, this is so cool, right? Because sound vibrates air basically, right? Sound, sound has to propagate through something. And, and what, when you get these things in molecules of air <clears throat> or even molecules in our body, right? When they sense sound, when they sense that vibration, whether it's audible sound or a vibratory sound, they do something called inelastic collisions. They collide, right? And these collisions release infrared. And so sound actually structures the water in our body because of the infrared that it produces. Wild, right? Wow. And so you can expand the exclusion zone based on sound. And then the other aspect of sound that's really, really powerful is this concept of cymatics. So are you familiar with cymatics? No. I took this amazing uh, course with this John Stuart Reed, who developed something called the cymoscope, which gives you the opportunity to see how sound can imprint pattern into water. 
Okay. Right. And so different sounds can, can create these beautiful, almost like crystal like patterns in water. Um, and so we have to recognize then that we are this network full of water. And so we have to see, know now that sound is when it imprints a pattern, the pattern can either be really coherent looking like a crystal uh, crystalline structure that looks really beautiful and coherent and organized, or it can create pretty much no pattern or it can look almost like a blob right. Um, that And so what we're now recognizing in the research is that sounds that create these beautiful patterns are ones that promote what's called quantum coherence or, or, or just a function of the body at that quantum level. And it also imparts information. Each pattern actually gives information um, and, and it imprints into the, that exclusion zone water in our bodies. Now, uh, John said that I asked him if they've got the studies to show this, right? And they do. They're being published in a couple of months. I'm super excited for this to come out because they've actually shown that sound imprints on the exclusion zone water itself, wow. which is so amazing. So that means that we have to mind our sound environment as well. So that ties to this idea of maybe why city living can be challenging, maybe why being next to a construction site can be challenging, uh, why people who work with heavy machinery uh, have certain, potentially have certain health challenges. Because uh, there's all these observational studies and I'm thinking that it's that, that cymatic imprint or lack thereof that can really be affected at that quantum level. Level. That's amazing. Okay. Um, and in regards to sort of sounds, in the studies, are they using sort of just a specific, um, for one of, I'm not sure if this will be the right word, but kind of pitch or, I mean, like a frequency, right? Yeah. Um, they, they're studying different frequencies. And, and yeah, I mean, there are some really harmonious frequencies. Um, you know, 432 hertz can be really harmonious. Uh, I believe it's 117. I'm, I might get 117, 118 hertz is like this unit uh, has been shown to be pretty universally harmonious as well. Really low ones as well, like 40 hertz um, has, is being studied. Uh, 40 hertz, actually, that sound is being studied to halt the progression of Alzheimer's. So it's very fascinating how, how influential sound is um, at so many levels. And so you look at different hertz can, can matter, but I guess the one conclusion is that there's always outliers. There's always people who actually don't respond to that sound. And so, you, so what a lot of these sound researchers who are now kind of studying it from this quantum perspective are realizing is it's very subjective. If you like the noise, if you like the sound, it's going to imprint harmoniously on your body. So that person who loves heavy metal that I personally could you know, it's really jarring for me. It's heavy metal actually was, was shown to be able to imprint cymatically. So if you like that, that it's not going to harm you necessarily. But for me, I don't, I would much rather listen to reggae or something, right? Like that's going to imprint differently and harmoniously for me. So it's so subjective, but, so it, but that makes it easy to apply, right? It's like, find music you love, find, find sounds you like yeah. and surround yourself with them. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes total sense. I was going to ask, you know, for your even gut instinct, if there wasn't research there around just actual music, um, because it just, to me, intuitively makes sense that if you've got something that you're enjoying, that at some level, it's going to be beneficial anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's so very subjective. And the other sound beyond music is like sounds of nature. Um, like a waterfall, the wind through the trees, they, these have such a broad range of sound. So the sound that you can't hear on kind of on both scales, the low frequency and the high frequency of the infrasonic and the ultrasonic, and then you've got the audible. So we can hear a waterfall, but there's also so many frequencies that extend above what we can hear and below what we can hear that we actually know it's like this wide range of frequencies that actually it's, it's almost like selectively imprinting my cells. It's, uh, it's like supplementing me with missing information. And so it's like, oh, wow, my mitochondria vibrate really well at 100 hertz, and they're missing that, right? They need that 100 hertz tune-up. Um, and so they can start oscillating and vibrating. And when they do, they actually form networks, really strong networks that optimize their function. So it's really amazing when we recognize how we're interacting with all of these things that we've, we've probably taken for granted most of our lives. Yeah. So, I mean, what you've said there, I mean, are we therefore saying that sounds is a way for the body to produce energy, mm -hmm. influencing and sort of structuring like mitochondria like that? Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that we know sound 
a vibration, a frequency, right? Uh, a, you know, a wiggle. Sound can produce infrared. So sound can create light. That light can structure water and provide information for our bodies. Um, so really sound and, and, and audible, inaudible sound can be so foundational mm -hmm. to just tending to the body from that, that quantum level. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then I'm just looking at my list of things that I wanted Ooh. to speak with you around. I kind of put the microbiome and leaky gut. I know we, we touched on this a little bit last time from a, from sort of a light perspective, ultimately. Sure. Um, but I know that you've been speaking a little bit also around leaky guts and how it can be sort of a circadian misalignment as it were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And with so many of our listeners and customers kind of having issues from a gut perspective, I'd love you to just expand on, on this concept. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this, this was key for me um, and a lot of my clients, right? Because I, I guess typically we hear, you know, okay, if you have a leaky gut, get rid of these inflammatory foods and everyone has their list of inflammatory foods and then, you know, challenge each food three weeks from now, right? You know, because that'll give the leaky gut enough time to heal and then you'll know your true reaction to those foods. And what I have found so fascinating is that gut cells are actually meant to completely turn over every 24 to 48 hours when you have an intact circadian mechanism, which means, so, so study, so who has an intact circadian mechanism? Who was studied? Well, there's so many, um, not so many, unfortunately, these days, but there are some really strong uh, indigenous cultures still that live with a strong circadian rhythm, right? A strong connection to nature. And when, when, they were given things that would make anyone else's leaky, like leaky gut way worse, right? Uh, soda, high fructose corn syrup, antibiotics, like you name it. They, they, they were unable to influence their, uh, the inflammatory status of the gut, right? Their gut was able to repair that damage so quickly that they never got leaky gut from that. And so from that, you have to say, okay, so maybe we're not being told everything we need to about leaky gut, maybe light and circadian rhythm somehow comes into play. And so we know that the gut cells, they have a clock mechanism. That clock mechanism syncs up to the clock in my brain. When I have an intact clock mechanism in my brain communicating to my gut and my gut can turn cells over a lot faster. And then you tie that to the fact that my gut bacteria are actually responding to the time in my brain as well. They're receiving that oscillation and optimizing their function. Then you have to say that, oh, okay, wait a second. So there is a crazy light component and day night cycle component to leaky gut. And if I can optimize that, maybe I'm not going to be able to eat a bunch of garbage, right? In a modern, modern lifestyle, I might not be able to eat a bunch of garbage, but at least I could heal that inflammation that much faster when I have that strong signaling into my eyes and the darkness at night. Yeah. And I know I've been reading a little bit around sort of microbiome and circadian rhythm recently. And it, it, from what I've read, obviously what you've talked about there from sort of the brain and the SCN being the master clock and sending that information down. And there's seems to be a slightly weaker sort of bi-directional link there as well, where the bacteria with their own kind of clocks are also influencing and sending a bit of information to the body and mm -hmm. that you mentioned light and obviously sort of time restrictive feeding being the second thing, especially from a gut perspective, that's gonna help just keep that circadian rhythm in, in, um, in tune. Yeah, absolutely. You got to give your cells a chance to clear the damage, right? If you're continually bombarding your gut with things that could potentially damage it. Um, so definitely, you know, I like an eight hour fueling window. I like an early fueling window. Um, in earlier in the day, I think it, I've seen great, uh, it's great for uh, leptin resistance, great for hormone balance, great for healing an inflamed gut. And you're right, those bacteria, what we don't recognize is that those bacteria, all bacteria, whether they're inside of us or in the world, release ultraviolet light. Uh, we can't see it, right? I can't just look at my arm and be like, oh, look at all that UV light coming from my skin bacteria, but they are. And that's how they communicate with each other. And they actually then communicate with uh, the ultraviolet light receptors we have in our gut and our, in our gut cells. So, so you have to ask yourself, why do we have ultraviolet light receptors in our gut? If UV doesn't penetrate the body, right? You, ultraviolet light penetrates very, very sh small, right? It doesn't really go into the body at all, but you have to see, say that, okay, when I, from development in utero, 
my gut was made up of the same, same cells as my lungs was made up of the same cells as my skin, my brain. It's that neuro ectoderm, right? They were all made from the same cell line in utero. So they have the, the same receptors for light. And it's not that they're interacting with the light that's coming from my environment inside of me. Those receptors are interacting from the light that the bacteria and also our cells emit some of that light as well. And so that's how the cells can communicate too. They can say, oh, it's, um, I recognize the time of day. I'm going to release ultraviolet light because serotonin needs to be made in the gut. Well, we, serotonin is, can help with bow, bow, um, um, uh, motility, right? Mm -hmm. And so someone who's, someone who's constipated, it's like, maybe you're not getting the right light signaling to communicate to the bacteria to release ultraviolet light, to make serotonin in your gut, to move your bowels. Um, because those serotonin, there's a, those, those receptors that tryptophan in the gut is converted to serotonin with UV light. Nice. It's crazy. I know it's crazy. <laughs> I know the, uh, bowel movements obviously have a very, or should have a very obvious circadian rhythm to them. So it's kind of right. witnessing that sunrise as a way to then trigger um, a bowel movement, I guess. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's one of the things people really report is that their bowel movements become very regulated to the morning. Um, and once it's strong, then, like I said, they can get still get away with, oh, they're, they're uh, not, they, they slept in, they couldn't get outside, whatever, whatever the circumstances, they, they can get away with not necessarily seeing the sunrise and it's still reinforced in their body and they're still going to able to have that regularity. Okay. So I have a, I have a, the simplest of questions for you now, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is just around kind of, you know, we talk about sunrise. So are we literally saying we should be outside as the sun is coming up at the horizon is there leeway in there what's kind of i guess what's optimal and what's what's um what's still going to do the job <laughs> uh, do you know i i wish there were like thousands of articles and studies on this right i'm going based on what i know about the light frequencies in the environment and my clinical observations okay. And so what I'm noticed, so we have to recognize before the sun actually breaks the horizon, the light is dominated really by the red and the infrared frequencies. It's very soothing, right? It's, it, it's not like when we walk, like walk outside at dawn, it's like jarring to our eyes, jarring to our senses. It's very soothing. Um, and so as soon as the sun starts to break the horizon and you don't have to see the sun break the horizon, right? You could have a backyard full of trees. And if you're just outside at sunrise, light will travel into your eyes. If your eyes are naked, right? Into no, no contact, no glasses if possible. Um, so, so being outside when the sun just breaks the horizon, whether you can see it or not, that's when that, that brightness of blue light coming to us intensifies. So you won't see a blue sky in the morning, right? Before, at dawn you will start to see a blue sky after sunrise. You'll start to see that the, the oranges and the pinks and things start to become more of a blue intensity. And so that's when, when you're outside at sunrise, uh, you're going to get that hormone signaling. Now I say you have uh, a leeway, you know, being outside before the sunrise, you can always get a benefit from, but if you're looking for the, that true circadian hormonal sunrise benefit, you got to try to figure out when sunrise is and see it probably within about 30 minutes, right? It's like a, a, a 30 minute wiggle room, but it doesn't have to be that long. It, it has to be consistent. You just got to do it consistently day in and day out. But it could be, I mean, for people who have seen my Instagrams, like sometimes my sunrise photos, I always try to post it in my stories, right? Sometimes it's me outside, right? In my backyard. Sometimes it's the window down in the parking lot at school right? Sometimes it's having pulled into a coffee shop, like by the coffee shop near my house. And I'm like taking one through the sunroof of my, you know, like, and so it's like, you can see the sunrise in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be consistent. And so you have about a 30 minute wiggle room to get that circadian effect really, really strong. Mm, okay. Perfect. That's helpful. And then I guess the follow-up question is around sort of sleep. Mm -hmm. So because if I think of when sunrise is, I think it was 4.52 this morning. Ah, mm, uh, yes. I You're know. way up on that northern latitude, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. um, and sunsets, you know, later I'm, I'm in beds. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious, like, do you just think from that perspective that, that, again, there's a seasonal, or there should be a kind of a seasonal thing with our sleep and that the idea of seven to nine hours is kind of a generic throughout the year recommendation is it doesn't necessarily feel like it fits. 
It, yeah, I would say I would say that there is a tendency for needing less sleep in the summer, especially at northern latitudes, and more sleep for sure in the winter. Um, and so we have to kind of honor that there might be a, a, a significant shift. Mm -hmm. But that being said, like, you know, I, I do get a lot of people reaching out saying, hey, I live in Iceland. Hey, I live in Greenland. Hey, like, I'm not gonna like, you know, it, the sun never sets. Like, what am I supposed to do? And at which point I say, you really need to just have a consistent morning time right? You know, try not to make it too late into the day. By the time vitamin D is available in your location, you, you kind of missed out on the morning light. So there's a lot of ways to assess vitamin D in your area, the D minder app, the circadian app, right? So just become familiar and try to get that morning light before the vitamin D and just try to do it consistently. And then you know, we're, we're circadian in the summer. It's like, we're supposed to be tired about 16 hours after we've officially, you know, kind of seen the sunrise and, and woken up. So 15 to 16 hours and just give your set up, set up a circadian day, right? Try to allow yourself to go to sleep. If it's a little later, be, not because you're staring at a screen, right? But if it's a little later, because you're just still energized from the light frequencies naturally in your environment, it's okay. But then in winter, the, the converse is true, Right. You, you do want to honor the darkness at night. You want to honor the darkness of winter and say, maybe this is a time where I do need more sleep. Mm -hmm. Maybe winter is not when I pack my social calendar full of late night stuff, right? Maybe it's a time where I can just allow that melatonin to do its repair during the winter months. And then I'll take advantage of when I have a little bit more energy and later, later nights or later evenings in the summer. So there's no perfect answer for it. I would say, try to get a consistent chunk before vitamin D is available to be made in your environment. And then, you know, honor the darkness in the winter. Amazing. Okay. I'm mindful of time, Carrie. I don't want to give you at least a few minutes before that. Before yeah, my next person. But, um, is there anything that you would just like to add to today's conversation that we haven't touched on yet? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think what's, I just want to emphasize that it, there's nothing perfect that you can do, but these, all of these little things add up to a big time benefit, right? And so um, it's not about, oh, uh, you know, I heard to, in order to get the benefit of earthing, you have to be out there for 40 minutes, right? Yeah, 40 minutes is great, but guess what? The effect happens within two seconds. So same thing with the light, you know, it, would it be ideal if we spent, you know, from sunrise until two hours later, you know, on a, on a lovely walk on the beach? Uh, absolutely, that would be beautiful. But is one minute outside during that sunrise window of time gonna do the job? Yes, if we do it consistently. So I really just want people to recognize it's not about being perfect, but it's about doing it. And it's about doing it consistently because that's where it really starts to add up and affect us at that quantum level. Perfect. As always, amazing content, amazing message. Thank you very much, Carrie. <laughs> Um, I'm hopefully that maybe one day we can do round three because <laughs> I could listen to, to you talk for plenty more hours to come still. Oh, um, Alex, thank you. I would love to do a round three. If there's questions, let's do it, right? If there's interest, let's chat more. We'll just kind of, yeah. hey, if you have any questions, ask them, right? And we, we'll answer them next time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Harry, right, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Alex. And we'll speak again soon. Awesome, Alex. Love chatting with you. See you soon. Uh -huh. Bye.